favorite things to do is talk about the Old Testament. And uh, for a couple of reasons. Number one, because um, I, I spent too much of my life not appreciating it. And so coming a little bit later to it, um, I, I think I have an appreciation of uh, catching up to do and, and not appreciating as much as I should have earlier on. There's a man by the name of Bob Waldron who has done a lot of work. He's written several books. Maybe you've heard his name before. And I listened to him preach several years ago um, when I was in my 20s. And I approached him and I said, Brother Waldron, I said, you, you have a, a, a tremendous grasp of Scripture from Genesis to Revelation. And I appreciate that so much. And would you study with me? And he said, yes, I would. And uh, very quickly, he exposed my ignorance. He would ask me questions, and he would say, "What do you do? You see the connection between uh, this and Daniel chapter two, for instance?" And he was talking about the kingdom and Daniel two. And at that time, I, I couldn't just recall what Daniel two was about. And he said, uh, "How long have you been preaching?" I said, "About five years." And he said, "Well, you're about four years past when you should know that." And uh, and he began to challenge me in those ways, and began to challenge my understanding and appreciation for the value of the Old Testament. So what I want to do is, in the lesson this evening, and a little bit more tomorrow night, is, is sort of just generally think about how valuable the Old Testament is. And then I want to spend the rest of the lessons, I think, illustrating that. So we'll go to Leviticus, and we'll see um, some lessons and connections in Leviticus to Jesus that I think are so very helpful, and, and helping us learn to read Leviticus with eagerness rather than um, uh, sort of mere duty, right? I think sometimes it's the sort of book you get to and you're thinking, well, here we are. I'm in my Bible reading program and we've uh, we've gotten to Leviticus and, well, I'm going to make it through it because, you know, I've got to check the box. But I don't know if we enjoy uh, a book like Leviticus. Well, Brother Waldron taught me to enjoy, to love a book lo of, like Leviticus. In Romans 15... And verse 4, it's a passage that you might be familiar with already. I'm sure many of you are. Paul says, um, whatever was written in earlier times was written for our instruction, so that through perseverance and the encouragement of the scriptures, we might have hope. So one of the things that is striking about the book of Romans, you have all these comparisons to the law. Um, and you see that in Hebrews as well, even more distinctly, comparisons between Jesus and the law. And, and an elevation. I mean, obviously, Jesus is better. It's a better covenant, better sacrifice, and all of that. And, and yet, Paul and the Hebrew writer use the Old Testament to make their case. That they build their case on the Old Testament with quotes from the Old Testament. So, in that sense, Paul is not saying, forget the Old Testament. No, he's saying, I'm going to show you. I'm going to, I'm going to take you by the hand through the Old Testament and lead you to Christ, um, which is what we ought to appreciate most of all about that, about the Old Testament. I want to look at some reasons why, as Bible students, we desperately need the Old Testament. He says it's written for our learning, and I think that is just the tip of the iceberg. It's not just like, oh, you can learn a few things. Good history lessons. We can learn some moral lessons back there. No, I think it's really vital uh, in order to appreciate the, the entirety of Scripture to have that foundation of the Old Testament. The first thing I want to talk about is that the Old Testament gives us a biblical vocabulary. Now, what I mean by that is that... Um, when any time that we're having a conversation, we, we're going to have variation of vocabulary. Now, that could be wildly varying. In other words, we could speak different languages, in which case the vocabulary is so far distant we can't even have a conversation. But even when we speak the same language, uh, there can be different phrases, um, different words that we use, and, and maybe even some different ways that we pronounce those words or use those words so that 
that puts a little bit of distance between us as we're having those conversations. Now, I'm from the American South, and we are known for colorful phrases. And, uh, and so when I go up north or even uh, into Canada, I will say things and people will make a double take. I remember being at the CNE one year, and I said something like, don't you reckon? And this girl looked at me and she said, did you just say reckon? And I said, I did. And she said, say it again. And, uh, and so that it was just not a phrase that she was familiar with. We might say, I'm going, I'm going to carry my mother to the grocery store. And uh, I've, I've had that kind of conversation. And someone looks and says, why would you, why would you carry your mother anywhere? And you, well, no, I mean, I'm going to go to her house. She's going to get in my car and I'm going to drive her to the grocery store. But we say that, right? Well, nobody in the South thinks anything of that. We all use that language. But when you take it out of the South somewhere else, now it's foreign. The Bible uses cultural phrases written in the culture that it was given to. And particularly, as we look at the New Testament, it is built onto those phrases that have already been put in place in the Old Testament. It's using Old Testament language as it continues on. Maybe the best example of this um, is in the book of Revelation. It's the book everybody loves to start with, isn't it? I want to study Revelation. It's so very exciting. Revelation is perhaps the most saturated New Testament book with Old Testament language. Now, not in thorough quotes. It doesn't say, you know, the prophet says. It's just imagery. And the imagery is from Ezekiel, from Daniel, from Zechariah, which, incidentally, are some difficult Old Testament books that we don't spend enough time in. And then we come to Revelation and we say, man, these phrases are weird. But they're really not once you put them back into their context. They sound weird because you're hearing them for the first time. But what if it's just the way the prophets talked? And then we put that into context and that sort of demystifies. It doesn't sound so just fantastic and radical. It sounds more like, this is the way you describe things. So, for instance, Matthew 24 is the same way. It bars a lot of that same language. It talks about the destruction of Jerusalem. When we start talking about the sky is falling, right? The sun uh, or the moon is going to fall and stars are going to fall. And you go back to the Old Testament. You look at repeated prophecies and you see the association. What you find is well, that means leaders are going to fall. That's what that's talking about. It's not saying literally the sky is going to fall. Literally the moon's going to fall out of the sky. But leaders are going to fall. And, and that just become, becomes common vocabulary. You understand what those phrases mean. Or that the sky is going to be red. Uh, that is war language, right? It's destruction of one nation coming upon another. We do that. Don't we say something like, boy, it'll be a dark day when this happens. Now, we don't mean that it's going to be a particularly cloudy day. We just, what we mean metaphorically, that it's going to be a dark day. But I think, I think some people come to the Bible and they think that the Bible uses vocabulary completely out of the norm. Like not the way we do. But it does. It's written to humans who use figurative speech and use uh, figures of speech. And, and, uh, and so we have to normalize that as we bring it into the New Testament. And as we do that, then it helps us become acclimated and the New Testament is easier to understand because we understand the, the sort of uh, context that that is put into. That's going to be the case in any literature you pick up. I like to read classic literature. I didn't used to. And one of the reasons I didn't used to is because when I would, it felt so distant. And, and what my wife, who is way smarter than me, and she can't even hear this. I'm, I'm just saying that not to impress her. She just is. She's brilliant. And she was trying to convince me, you should, you should try this. And so I read through a piece of classic. I read some Charles Dickens, which is not that classic. But nevertheless, it's foreign. And she said, try it again. So I'll read through it again. And all along, what happens is eventually hey, I'm starting to see these repeated phrases. I'm starting to get the vocabulary in my head, and it becomes easier and easier, and now it's very natural to pick up one of those books, and I understand 
uh, the descriptions and so forth. So you have to have that context. A lot of people, I think, I don't know if they believe this, but they certainly imply that the New Testament is just sort of starting over. Right? The Old Testament, that didn't work out. We're just going to start over. And in the book of Matthew, uh, you know, reset button. No, no, no. In the book of Matthew, what you have is the story picks up right where it left off. Um, not only is it written with that, but it is written with the expectation that you know the Old Testament. All through the New Testament, references are made with no context or explanation. It just is an assumption that you know these stories. Jude, verse 11. In Jude, verse 11, it says, uh, Woe to them, for they have gone the way of Cain, and for pay they have rushed headlong into the air of Balaam and perished in the rebellion of Korah. Now, if I just went out on the streets of Toronto and I polled people, I might find some people who know who Cain is because his name gets mentioned in culture uh, and uh, in, even in movies and so forth. I wonder if I would find 1% of people on the street who know who Balaam is or Korah and the rebellion of Korah, Dathan, and Abiram. These are obscure Old Testament stories. And yet he just rattles them off like, don't be like Balaam. And I think there's a lot of Christians who might go, who? But Jude expected the people he was writing to not only to know who Balaam was, but what precisely he did wrong and not to be like him. And the same thing, of course, with Korah. Just the expectation is there. As we look at um, very passing references, minor references to Old Testament stories. If you look over in John chapter 1, John chapter 1, you uh, may recall there the story of the calling of the uh, apostles, uh, the very first uh, apostles who come to follow Jesus. And among them is a man named Philip who goes and tells his friend Nathaniel about Jesus. And he's, he calls him Jesus of Nazareth. And Nathaniel in verse 46 says, can anything good come out of Nazareth? And Philip said, said to him, come and see. And Jesus saw Nathaniel coming to him and he said, he said of him, behold, an Israelite indeed in whom there is no deceit. Nathaniel said to him, how do you know me? Jesus answered and said to him, before Philip called you, when you were under the fig tree, I saw you. Nathaniel answered him, Rabbi, you are the son of God. You are the king of Israel. Jesus answered and said to him, Because I said to you that I saw you under the fig tree, do you believe? You will see greater things than these. And he said to him, Truly, truly, I say to you, you will see the heavens opened and the angels of God ascending and descending on the Son of Man. Now that phrase there, ascending and descending, it's only found uh, angels ascending and descending. Only found one other place in Scripture. And that's in Genesis chapter 28. And if you remember, there's the story of Jacob. Jacob is fleeing from his brother's murderous intentions. Esau wants to kill him because he's taken the birthright by deceit. And so he's running away there. And uh, he comes to this place and, and makes a, a pillow out of a stone, goes to sleep. And the Lord appears to him in a dream. And he sees angels ascending and descending on a ladder. We call that Jacob's ladder sometimes. All right. So he sees this vision of angels ascending and descending. That little seed is planted there in Genesis 28. And it sits there for 1,500 years. And Jesus picks that imagery up. And to these Jews who would have known that story and heard it all their lives, he would have said, I am the latter. I am the means by which God communes with men. Angels ascending and descending, God sending blessings, and, and uh, there's communion between man and God. And Jesus says, I'm the latter. I'm how that happens. Well, can you imagine a Jew hearing that and thinking, you're the latter of Jacob's dream from 1,500 years ago? Yes. And he has been the whole time, but they just now found out about it. Now that, that's pretty subtle. That's very subtle. In fact, if you were to just pick up your Bible and you were to start reading in Genesis chapter 1, 
and you're going through and you get all, all the way to John 151, you probably, on your first reading, are not going to remember that you read that back in Genesis 28. But people who would be saturated with those stories, those were their bedtime stories. It's what they've heard all their lives. They would get it. And it's one of the reasons why I think we miss some of the claims of Jesus, some of the claims of deity. When Jesus uh, makes claims of deity, sometimes subtly by using Old Testament language, when he calls himself I am. Now we hopefully know that reference from Exodus chapter 3 in the burning bush when God calls himself the great I am. Um, but references like that, where Jesus makes a, a reference that does equate him with God, and maybe we don't pick up on it because we haven't saturated ourselves with Old Testament language, with that vocabulary that would point in that direction. I already talked about Matthew 24 uh, and the book of Revelation. Um, I think one of the things that that we have to be careful about is that we don't make an appendix out of the Old Testament. Uh, sometimes what we do, we're reading, reading through the New Testament. And we see an Old Testament quote, see a cross-reference, and says, okay, that's, that's from you know, this book. And, uh, and so we go back and we look up the cross-reference. We say, okay, now I've got that, and, and, and that's really what I need. right? I just need the Old Testament by way of reference. It's like a footnote. It's so much more than that. Having it available as a reference is not the same as having it in our hearts. Um, in Matthew 4, when Jesus is tempted, you know that he, he quotes Scripture three times. He quotes from the book of Deuteronomy. Now, I don't know about you, but if I were to say in, in times of distress and times of difficulty, I find that my greatest comfort lies in the book of Deuteronomy. Well, most people wouldn't say that. But when Jesus came up against temptation, that's where he went. And he had, he had an answer ready in his heart uh, and ready for that precise moment. Here it is. He is in the wilderness being tempted of the devil. And what does he do? He goes back to when God's people were in the wilderness being tempted. And he finds what Moses said to them. And he picks that up and he uses it against Satan and says, here. Here's an answer to your temptations. That is having it at the ready. That's not, that's not having it like an appendix that you go look up the answers. It's just here. And if you have that context, when you're reading about Jesus answering, you have that context already in your mind, you can see what Jesus is doing. Like when he says, man shall not live by bread alone, but by every word that proceeds from the mouth of God, you go back and what you find is that Moses is giving them that in reference to what they should have learned about the manna that they received. So it's like a, it's like a context on top of a context. And it just opens up just, I think, drastically deeper meaning to what Jesus is doing than just that sort of surface reading, that surface reference to the Old Testament. And in fact, I think it gets, it gets dangerous if you don't have that. Romans chapter 9 makes reference to Jacob and Esau. And it does it in a way that it sounds like that God has saved Jacob as an individual and has condemned Esau as an individual. And it's nothing of the sort. He quotes, first of all, Genesis 25. And he says, the older shall serve the younger. You go back and look at the context. It says there are two nations. And so he's not talking about Jacob and Esau as individuals, but rather he's talking about the two nations that will come from Jacob and Esau. And, and that, that the interaction between those two nations will be like this. And even then the second part of that quote in Romans 9, he says that, Jacob I have loved and Esau I have hated. And so there's a lot of people that say, see, God just picks the people he loves and he picks the people he hates and there's nothing you can do about it. And yet that quote comes from Malachi. Well after Jacob and Esau are dead and the nations have come from Jacob and Esau, Israel and, and Edom. And in that case, what God is saying to, to Israel is that I have destroyed Edom for her sins, and I have continued to allow you to exist. 
And he's not talking about individual salvation. He's talking about national existence, which, of course, is the what's at issue in Romans chapter 9. But if you don't have that context, then you think God picks winners and losers and saves some and rejects others. And you get a sense of sort of determinism that I think is an antithetical to everything else the Scripture says. So it's important because it uh, can can lead us into false doctrine if we don't have that context as we're reading through the New Testament. That's the vocabulary that I want us to have in mind, um, the foundation as we're coming into the New Testament. Well, it builds anticipation for the New Testament as well. Um, have you ever have you ever walked in at the end of a movie and you haven't seen you know, the the first nine-tenths of the movie. And you see that the ending is very dramatic, and it's impressive, but you're just not sure exactly what's going on. And, uh, and maybe even it's impressive enough that you get really a pretty good sense of what the movie is probably about. But then you go watch the whole thing, and you're like, oh, and, and it kind of more pieces come into play, and you have a greater appreciation, even if the very end of it by itself was impressive. I, I think like, uh, you know, Chariots of Fire, that's a really old movie, but, uh, you know, the, the grand uh, music that plays as, as this Olympic runner uh, who, uh, you know, stood by his convictions. You don't know any of that. You just see that he's winning the race, right? And, uh, and so it's, it, 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 you, you get this victorious picture, but you don't understand why it's so important. Then you go back and you read or you listen to the rest of the movie, watch the rest of the movie, and now you got a sense of what's happening there. Well, I think the New Testament is that way. You can absolutely appreciate the sacrifice of Jesus. It's dramatic in its own right. And it doesn't need the, the context of the Old Testament for you to get a sense of this is really big and this is really dramatic and really important. But I don't think you can get a sense of the depth of its importance and the depth of, of its meaning and its value without that Old Testament context. Because what God does in the Old Testament is educate us on the need for Jesus and what it is exactly that he's coming to do for us. You get some of that in the New Testament, but you don't get the full picture. It, it does this in several different ways. It does it, first of all, by way of prophecy, and that prophecy builds and builds. It starts in Genesis chapter 3 and verse 15. When sin enters the world, and we find that um, that God, in bringing the curses against the serpent and then against man and woman, that he says to the serpent that, uh, that from your seed and her seed, the seed of woman, will come uh, these, these conflicts, and her seed, the one that comes from her seed, will crush your head. You'll bruise his heel, but he'll crush your head. And so we see that, that conflict that is pointed to between uh, Satan and Jesus. In chapter 12, in verses 1 and 2, we see the promises that are made to Abraham. And of course, particularly the seed promise that would point to Jesus. And we see that passed down, then of course, through Isaac and then through Jacob. And, uh, and then we go on and we see that promise kind of gaining momentum. And we see the additional element of a son of David who would sit on the throne and and then we go into captivity, we come back from captivity, and the promises get very messianic about the, the kingdom uh, that would be established forever. And uh, the temple that would be built without hands, Ezekiel describes that temple at the end of his prophecy. And so, I mean, even today, Jews who are still practicing Jews today, they still sort of are on the edge of their seats, right? If they're faithful Jews, as much as you could be a faithful Jew today, uh, they're still waiting for that Messiah. I talked to a guy today in the airport in uh, uh, Charlotte. I was in the airport for four hours. And uh, so this guy um, was sitting next to me, and he uh, asked me something, and we started a conversation, and he told me he was a Jew. And so I told him that I was going to be preaching about his law this week. And, uh, and so he... Ended up asking me a lot of questions about Jesus and about how that relates to the law and everything. And his idea is that they're, they're, they are desperately waiting at this point. Where is he? 
And the, and the Jew was saying, this fellow, he was saying, I, I'm, I'm, I'm frankly frustrated. I don't understand why he hasn't come yet. And I kind of said, well, buddy, have I got good news for you? You know, um, you don't have to be frustrated. He, he has come. So that anticipation being built by that prophecy, it does it, I think, even uh, more so and more thoroughly through foreshadowing. Over in Colossians chapter 2, which is the passage we frequently go to to show that the Old Testament has been nailed to the cross, and rightly so. Um, but I want to notice what he says about that law in addition to the handwriting requirements being nailed to the cross. He says in verse 17, these things which were or which are a mere shadow of what is to come, but the substance belongs to Christ. So when we look at the Old Testament and we're reading through the sacrifices and we go, well, we don't offer those sacrifices anymore. It, it, that's, that's not entirely precise. I think what it's better to say is that we have come to the culmination of those sacrifices, right? So it's not we just done away with them. It's that Jesus fulfills them. And we'll talk more about that um, in uh, one of our lessons on Saturday, I think. The Law of Offerings will be uh, on Saturday. Um, when we look at the Sabbath day, um, I think that's one of the most beautiful images that Jesus picks up. You know, he does so much healing on the Sabbath. You ever ask yourself, why does he do that? Is it just to get under the Pharisee's skin? You know, he knows it'll get him going. Um, no, I don't think that's why Jesus does that. Luke chapter 13. This is just briefly. I want to show you this. Luke chapter 13. And there in verse 10, it says, uh, He was teaching in one of the synagogues on the Sabbath. And there was a woman who for 18 years had had a sickness caused by a spirit. And she was bent double and could not straighten up at all. And when Jesus saw her, he called her over and said to her, Woman, you are freed from your sickness. And he laid his hands on her and immediately she was made erect again and began glorifying God. But the synagogue official, indignant because Jesus had healed on the Sabbath, began to say to the crowd in response, There are six days in which, one should, in which work should be done, so come during them and get healed, and not on the Sabbath day. But the Lord answered and said, You hypocrites, does not each of you on the Sabbath untie his ox or his donkey from the stall and lead him away to water? And this woman, a daughter of Abraham, as she is, whom Satan has bound for eighteen long years, should she not have been released from this bond or bondage on the Sabbath day. Now, if you go back and you read the Deuteronomy's version, the, the repetition of the Ten Commandments in Deuteronomy chapter 5, where Moses goes through the Ten Commandments again. In that second occasion, um, the first occasion he says, remember the Sabbath because six days the Lord created the earth and on the seventh he rested. But on the second time, in Deuteronomy 5, he says, remember it because the Lord brought you out of Egypt, delivered you from bondage, and gave you rest. Now here's Jesus using the language of bondage and release from bondage. He says, uh, you are, be free. He freed her from her sickness. And then when they question him about it, he says, Satan has bound her. And should she not be loosed or freed from her bondage on the Sabbath day? The idea here is that what we have in the Old Testament there with the Sabbath is a picture of rest. And it's not just rest for its own sake. It's rest that's pointing to something even greater. And when Jesus gets here and he starts healing on the Sabbath and they say, what are you doing? He's fulfilling the Sabbath. He is freeing a woman from her bondage and giving her rest on the very day that God said is all about freedom from bondage and rest. But they missed it because all they saw was the surface. They just saw a rule. They're going to follow it and even make up some extra rules to follow it, but completely missed the point. Brethren, if, if we go to the Old Testament and all we see is rules, then we are no better at reading that than the Pharisees were. And we ought to be, because we've got a lot more information than they had. And we've got all the rebukes that Jesus offered towards them. And so, 
all of that foreshadowing pointing to these better things, these greater things, uh, but there are the pictures in the Old Testament. Well, of course, it also does this by um, the anticipation of recognizing that something greater is necessary. Uh, over in Romans chapter 7, there's this passage where Paul, uh, you might recall, sort of is wrestling with uh, the mindset of what it was like to be under the law. He says um, in chapter 7 and verse 10 of Romans, and this commandment, which was, to, which was to result in life, proved to result in death for me. The law was given to bring life, right? That's what, that's what God says. You follow this, there's life in following this law. And Paul says, I found death in the law. And he goes on beginning in verse 13 and, and sort of laying out this sort of miserable circumstance, this feeling of, of hopelessness under the law. So you get to the, old, the end of the Old Testament, and you're like, is there any way out? And of course, the New Testament opens up and says, well, yes, yes, there is. And that's what he says at the end of chapter 7. Thanks be to God, it's through Jesus Christ, that we have found uh, escape from the hopelessness uh, that the law by itself, uh, without, the, uh, without the mercy of God being communicated fully through Jesus, leaves us in. Let's say one more, a couple more things about that, and then we'll move on to the next point. Um, in Genesis chapter 3, this is one of the things I try to do when I start studying the Bible with somebody who never read the Bible before. They're just opening it for the first time. We read through the first couple of chapters. We'll establish the creation, and then we come to chapter 3, which is, um, like if you're ever reading a novel... Uh, one of the, the things that happens as a novel in a novel is conflict is introduced, right? I think all novels are a reflection of the book, right? And, and so the conflict that's introduced is there in chapter 3, and it's sin entering into the world. And of course, you know that uh, after that sin, God uh, speaks the consequences, the curse to the woman and to the man, and, uh, and then down in verse 24, it says he drove out the man uh, and at the east of the Garden of Eden, he stationed the cherubim, the flaming sword, which turned in every direction to guard the way to the tree of life. So they, they lose the garden. And more importantly, uh, they lose access to the tree of life that was in the garden. And they are cursed. Well, you go all the way over to Revelation chapter 22. There we are at the beginning, introducing the conflict, and here we are at the end, um, giving, finding the, the ultimate resolve. It says in Revelation 22, beginning of verse 1, Then he showed me a river of the water of life, clear as crystal, coming from the throne of God and of the Lamb, and in the middle of its street, on either side of the river was the tree of life, bearing twelve kinds of fruit, yielding its fruit every month, and the leaves of the tree were for the healing of the nations. And there will no longer be any curse, and the throne of God and of the Lamb will be in it, and his bondservants will serve him. So here, curse comes in. We lose access to the tree of life. Here, the tree of life is back. We are in the presence of the tree of life, and there is no longer any curse. And it takes all of this to get from point A to point B. And so that's the story of God bringing about the repair of what was damaged in the garden uh, in sin. And so there's seeds planted all along the way. And, and what we find is in the New Testament, it's all those seeds sprouting. Well, um, finally, it is the word of God. Maybe, maybe this is the most important. Maybe we should just start there. Um, when Paul wrote in 2 Timothy chapter 3 and verse 16 that all scripture is given by inspiration of God and that it's all profitable, he wasn't talking about the New Testament. He wasn't even talking about the New Testament Psalms and Proverbs like we have our Testaments sometimes with those, those two Old Testament books because that's the only two Old Testament books that are worth very much, right? I guess. No, he's saying that Timothy had learned from his youth well, the only thing that would have been available was the Old Testament. The scriptures that brought him to salvation. 
the Old Testament brought into salvation. And that those scriptures continue to be profitable. Doctrine, or proof, or correction, and righteousness. I think sometimes we, we shove it off and we're not sure about it being profitable for all those things. But let me, let me say this. Even if, even if it didn't have that element there in 2 Timothy 3 and 16 and 17, saying that it was profitable for all these things, if it just said it all comes from God, that's worth the reading for its own sake. When my wife and I were dating 23 years ago, um, we lived a, a few hours apart. And so we wrote letters um, just about every other day. We were sending letters back and forth. And I mean like actual pen, actual piece of paper, um, sticking that in an envelope and putting it in the mail. And um, when you when you would get one of those letters, um, you it's exciting, right? You, your heart leaps, and you want to read every word. And so usually what would happen, you, you tear it open, and you read through it fairly quickly because you just, you're excited to get those words. Then what do you do? Well, I'd like to read that one more time. This one will read a little slower because now that I got the whole thing, I want to soak it in just a little bit more. But you treasure those words from people you care deeply about. And you save them. And they're still in a shoebox uh, in my closet. And I get them out still and read them sometimes. There's no greater treasure. God, God has not spoken to us with a running commentary. He has in a few, over the course of all of human history... In a few moments, he has spoken to man. I want to know every word that came down. There's not a single word that God has spoken that I, I, I want to think about in such a way as like, well, I don't know that that's all that it is. It came from God. How could you say that's not important? It's the words of the one whose word created everything. That makes it valuable in and of itself. When we think about it, though, in terms of it still being applicable, does the Old Testament apply to us? I understand we're not living under the law, that it doesn't apply to us in that way. But notice what Jesus says about the law in Matthew chapter 5. In Matthew chapter 5, as he is about to begin his statements, you have heard that it was said, but I say unto you. And in so doing, I think, give them a deeper appreciation for the, what the law says. But he says in verse 17, Do not think that I came to abolish the law or the prophets. I did not come to abolish, but to fulfill. For truly I say to you, until heaven and earth pass away, not the smallest letter or stroke shall pass from the law until, it is, until all is accomplished. Whoever then annuls one of the least of these commandments and teaches others to do the same shall be called least in the kingdom of heaven. But whoever keeps and teaches them, he shall be called great in the kingdom of heaven. I think what Jesus ends up doing is pointing to the law. When Jesus starts teaching, they think the, the teachers of his day, the leaders of his day, they think that he's contradicting the law. And what, what is the reality is he is living it out perfectly. And it exposes how very imperfectly they are living it out. And what that ought to tell us is that the law, you know, and, and talking to people sometimes, I ask them, I say, what would it look like if somebody held strictly to the law in every particular? And I ask it that way because I'm, I want them to be thinking in a, in a certain direction. And they'll say, I guess it would look like the Pharisees. Not even close. What the law perfectly lived looks like is God on earth. It's Jesus. And so sometimes we look at the law and say, well, I'm glad we don't live under that. Well, I am glad that we do not live under uh, in a time where it was so corrupted. And corrupted by the leaders of the day, by the priests of the day. Um, 
But wouldn't you want to live in a society of people who all act like Jesus? I would. And so from that standpoint, the law is beautiful. And, and its fulfillment is Jesus. In Romans chapter 10 and verse 4, it says the end of the law is Jesus. Now that doesn't mean that you get to Jesus and he cuts it off and it's over. No, it means that that's the finishing point. Like the law was taking the, and, and I think that's part of the point of Romans, that these people who are clinging to the law, he says, if you were really and truly faithful to the law, you would have recognized Jesus when he got here. And it would be a seamless transition from following God faithfully under the law to following Jesus as he comes to be the very embodiment of that holiness that, that God shows us through the law. So I think about that, Jesus being that perfect fulfillment. And people will complain sometimes, not, not frequently, maybe not as frequently as it used to, but I've been places where um, I'm teaching a lot in the Old Testament. We sure are spending a lot of time in the Old Testament. And, uh, you know, Jesus is our Savior. And we need to be talking more about Him. And I'm like, are you paying attention? We are talking about Him. When Jesus is on the road to Emmaus uh, with these fellas, and he, he um, it, it says that He began to tell them all the things concerning Himself, beginning with Moses and the prophets. That's where we start learning about Jesus. It's all the way back there with Moses and the prophets. Old Testament preaching, like all preaching, when done well, will continually point to Christ and Him crucified, which is what Paul said he preached. Jesus um, and Paul, the way they reference the Old Testament, um, they reference it as already established truth. In Matthew chapter 19, Matthew chapter 19, which uh, is the uh, occasion of the question concerning marriage and divorce. And uh, they say, um, is it lawful for a man to divorce his wife for any reason at all? That's verse 3. He answered and said, have you not read that he who created them from the beginning made them male and female? And he said, for this reason, a man shall leave his father and mother and be joined to his wife, and the two shall become one flesh. Jesus frequently does this. So they ask a question, and Jesus says, what does it say? And guess what? That's still our answer. And that hadn't changed. Is that Jesus goes back and he says, God has, from the very beginning, told us what he wants about marriage. And um, even... Even in the law, there are provisions, he says, but some of those provisions, and I think, in fact, some perversions of those provisions, uh, have to do more with their stubbornness than what God wants to do with marriage. But this, from the beginning, is what God has said about marriage. And so, we continue to appeal to principles, eternal principles, like those established at creation, in order to learn things today. Over in um, Romans chapter 12 and verse 19. Romans chapter 12 and in verse 19. Paul says, uh, Never take your own revenge, beloved, but leave room for the wrath of God. For it is written, Vengeance is mine, I will repay, says the Lord. So he appeals to what is already established? What is already written? Over in 1 Corinthians chapter 9 is maybe one of the most interesting references. Um, there where Paul is um, establishing that he had rights that he had foregone for their sakes. So he's trying to convince them that, that foregoing your own rights for the sake of others is a good thing. And so he says, I've foregone rights. And one of the rights he has is to be paid for the preaching of the gospel. And he says, uh, in order to establish that right, he says in verse 8 of 1 Corinthians 9, I'm not speaking these things according to human judgment, am I? Or does not the law also say these things? For it is written in the law of Moses, you shall not muzzle the ox while he is threshing. And so in order to establish that God wants preachers to be paid, 
He says, God said, feed the ox when he's working. Now, that's a pretty humble approach because it says, feed the dumb ox up here because he's doing some work. But notice what he says as he continues on. God is not concerned about oxen, is he? Well, I don't know. It sounds like he kind of is. But what Paul is saying is, no, here's what you need to learn from that. If God makes a provision and says, you need to make sure and feed your animal when he's working, how much more should you be concerned about feeding men when they are working for you? Now, we don't live under the law from the standpoint of strictly following um, each of these laws procedurally. But the principle that you take care of all who work for you, that doesn't go away with the law. And Paul says it's still there and it's still teaching you. And it's still teaching you that, uh, that even today uh, you ought to take care in this way. Well, as we look at that, some people want to have a formula for how to know when to apply, when to not apply the Old Testament to ourselves. When is the Old Testament, quote, authoritative, and when is it not authoritative? And I think sometimes, I mean, I think we need to appreciate lessons about our relationship to that uh, Christ crucified and what that does to the old law. But if we're not careful, we draw those lines, I think, if we're not precise in our language about that, we end up leaving people with the impression that the law is crucified in a way that it's not even instructive to us. That is not that is not helpful. Because then when we want to go and we want to show what God says about marriage, we want to go show what God says maybe about a question of modesty or something like that. But, oh, we don't learn from the Old Testament. Yeah, well, of course we learn from the Old Testament. So how do you know? How do you know what you can learn and maybe what you cannot learn? I, I think the same way we do with any scripture, including the New Testament. Over in Matthew chapter 19, in Matthew chapter 19, towards the end of the chapter, you have this rich young ruler who comes to Jesus. You recall, he asks what he may do to inherit eternal life. And after this back and forth, it comes down to it that um, Jesus says, uh, if you wish, is verse 21, if you wish to be complete, go and sell your possessions and give to the poor. And you will have treasure in heaven. And come follow me. Now, I don't know what all you have, but I gather everyone in here has some possessions that no one in here has sold everything that they have. So why have we not specifically applied that to ourselves? Well, we understand some context. And we understand that Jesus is specifically addressing a problem that this young man has. In fact, he gives a more general answer. First, do what God says, right? Follow the commands. And God says, I've done all that. What else? And Jesus says, all right. You want more? Here's what more looks like. And so we understand that, that there is a need for us to divest ourselves of attachment to the things of this world. For some people, that may mean you've got to give up, and maybe even everything. But that is not consistent with what we find, at, for instance, in the book of Acts where people continue to have possessions. People have houses that they meet in and so forth. So this does not get applied across the board. And, and so we understand that. And, and we, we understand that there's something to learn from the story with the rich young ruler, but that universal application of that specific instruction is not what we're supposed to do with that. Well, I think the same thing is true with the Old Testament. That you understand that when he says, uh, when he gives very specific dress codes and he says you're supposed to have this uh, blue tassel and so forth i noticed nobody came in here with blue tassels tonight uh, but, but it's instructed we don't do that but i'll tell you what we do learn from that and many other laws and we'll talk more about this we talk about the glory of holiness is that what god was calling his people to do is be separate and distinct and i'll tell you what he still wants that today that hasn't changed maybe how we apply it how we get there to the same place has changed. Um, the specifics have changed. But the principle, the concepts, they're still in place. I think the idea is that there is a foundational 
um, truth. There is foundational truth underneath every law that God gives in the Old Testament. And the particulars that are built on that to illustrate that, clean meats and things of that nature and, and, and laws about um, um, hygiene and so forth, all of that that's built on these principles, that gets wiped away. But underneath that, nothing goes away. You know, the, the foundations of who God is and what he's teaching about himself with these laws, that stays right in place so that we can continue to go back and say, here's who God is. Don't you know what he said back here? Uh, that's still his word. It still means something. It still tells us something about who he is and, in fact, about who Jesus is. Those are the sorts of things we're going to be looking at uh, more and more as we go through the week. Tomorrow night, what we're going to be talking about more specifically is Jesus in the Old Testament and his specific relationship uh, to the Old Testament. We're just going to scratch the surface. Um, we barely did that tonight. We're going to try to dig a little bit deeper. But as uh, Tommy Peeler likes to say, uh, uh, preacher that I think is, does such good work at these connections, and somebody asked him, have you ever made a list of all the passages in the Old Testament that, re that refer to Jesus, that are connected to Jesus? And he said, yeah, it starts in Genesis chapter 1 and it ends in Malachi chapter 4. Anything short of every page is almost certainly going to be missing something. But we're going to look at a few of those references uh, tomorrow night. I'm not ashamed to own my Lord, nor to defend his cause.